Hello everyone. We are going to continue our review of wonders of the ancient world tonight. There are already three episodes in this series, but you can listen to all of them independently. I also recommend that you turn off stable volume on YouTube because it deteriorates the sound of my videos with a loud white noise in the background. It is not always easy to turn it off on mobile, but if you persist, it will work eventually. Tonight, I'll tell you about the statue of Zeus at Olympia, a giant seated figure placed in the temple of Zeus that was famous for the striking effect it had on visitors. Ivory, gold, ebony, precious stones, no spending on exotic and rare materials had been spared to make it. We will talk about the statue itself, what happened to it, what it tells us of the culture of the time, And I will also elaborate on the city, or more precisely, the site, the sanctuary of Olympia, which is famous as the cradle of Olympic Games, obviously, but in antiquity it was also, and maybe first and foremost, a religious center, and it had a history of its own. So, let's get started. Imagine this. Inside a Greek temple, a 12 meters tall, or 41 feet tall, statue of the King of Gods, seated on a throne, crowned with a sculpted wreath of olive sprays, wearing a gilded robe. In its right hand, a shining statue of goddess Nike, Nike in Greek, the goddess of victory, and in its left hand, a long scepter inlaid with different metals. The eyes and ornamentation of the throne contain countless gems, and everywhere, the shine of gold the smooth polish of ivory, the dark tones of ebony, and the striking vision of a giant that seems ready to unroof the temple if he decided to stand up. This statue, placed in the temple of Zeus at Olympia, was the most famous of the greco roman world for centuries, together with the Colossus of Rhodes, But this one was sacred, and it remained in history as one of the most extravagant and spectacular statues ever made. How, why, by whom, and what happened to it? This is what we are going to find out. Looking at the statue of Zeus, Two elements dominated, gold and ivory, two very precious materials to the Greeks. This type of statue is called chryselephantine, from Greek chrysos, gold, and elephantinos, ivory. And this choice of materials was not something new when the statue of Zeus was made. In the 5th century BC, Greece already had a long tradition of such chryselephantine sculptures. They were made especially for temples, as objects of adoration, and they enjoyed very high status in ancient Greece. Typically, these sculptures were built around a wooden frame, that was covered in thin plaques 
slabs of ivory that represented the skin of the subject and sheets of gold leaf that represented the clothes, the hair, the armor if there was one, and other details. Gold and ivory were not the only materials used. Sometimes details were made with different gems or glass paste. But every material used, every technique employed, was out of the ordinary and contributed to the rarity and the value of the statue, financial, artistic and religious value. This tradition of using gold and ivory may have been about a thousand years older than the statue of Zeus. We know it because archaeology has revealed remains of this type of sculptures from the second millennium BC, in various parts of what would be the Greek world, including in Crete and continental Greece. As far as we know, Greece elephantine statues were always limited to cult statues, and typically the sculptures would be life-size or greater than life-size. They were made to impress the crowds. Given their size and what they were made of, these statues needed a lot of costly elements. They were a big investment. But it is believed that the statues were not untouchable. In times of need, some of the gold that covered the wooden frame of the statue could be uh, removed and melted for coin or in order to pay for whatever urgency the city where the statue was would be facing. So on top of the religious importance and the showmanship involved into making these big shiny sculptures that existed to impress people, they were also a reserve of value, a treasure that could be tapped into. In that sense, the Greeks were rather pragmatic or utilitarian with their spending on religious figures. I don't think we have examples of such a practice in other old civilizations of the Mediterranean, like the Egyptians, who also made golden statues, but without the option of getting the gold back if needed. They would actually bury huge treasures with prominent people. In any case, this type of statues multiplied in the archaic and classical periods of ancient Greece. That is to say, the centuries in the middle of the first millennium BC. Which is when the two most famous chryselephantine statues were made, and they could also have been the tallest of them. One was the statue of Zeus at Olympia, and the other was in Athens, the statue of Athena Parthenos, a monumental statue of goddess Athena, the patron goddess of Athens, that the Athenians financed in the 5th century BC. It was spectacular, at almost 12 meters, only a touch shorter than the statue of Zeus. Even though the proportions were more modest, because Zeus measured 12 meters seated, whereas Athena was standing up. But her skin was made of ivory, and her clothes, her crown, and a smaller statue of the goddess of victory, Nike, in her hand, were all in gold. This statue was also lost, and the precious parts were probably recycled sometime in the first millennium AD. But its appearance is well known from descriptions and plenty of smaller reproductions in marble. 
the Chris Elephantine statues of Zeus and Athena had the same author, one of the most famous sculptors and painters of classical Greece, an artist and an architect called Phidias. He designed the two statues, designed rather than sculpted, because these statues were quite hard to make and maintain. They required a team and constant care, not only to create them, but then to keep them in good state. The structure itself was made of wood, and even though wood became invisible under the layers of gold or the ivory slabs, wood is still perishable. It expands and contracts due to temperature or humidity. On a 12 meters or 40 feet sculpture, that can make the size change by several centimeters or several inches. So regularly, the statue had to be uh, repaired, maintained, so that cracks would not appear, or parts would not fall down. This is also why no complete chryselephantine statue reached us. On top of being precious and attractive to thieves, they were just not durable enough. It is believed that the last ones disappeared in the late antiquity and early middle ages. Still, some of them, such as Athena Parthenos or Zeus at Olympia, were successfully maintained for several centuries. And this is why we have abundant proof of their existence. Now, why a statue of Zeus at Olympia? Olympia was first and foremost a sanctuary, a religious center where all Greeks could go. It was not a city-state like Athens or Sparta. The nearest polis, the nearest city of a significant size that controlled the site of Olympia, was an ancient Greek city called Elis. E -L -I -S. And Elis was also the name of the region of Western Peloponnese, where Olympia is located. The Peloponnese is this peninsula to the south of Greece. It is connected to the continent by the Isthmus of Corinth, and it was the place where many Greek cities emerged and also where countless Greek myths are traditionally located. It is part of the heart of ancient Greece. As you know, Greece was not unified, at least not before Alexander the Great organized an alliance of all Greek states behind him, or centuries later when the Romans annexed Greece. But in times of independence, Greek kingdoms and city-states were in a complex game of diplomacy, alliances and wars. They competed for trade and for the founding of colonies around the Mediterranean Sea. But they still had a sense of belonging to the same cultural area or cultural tradition, which manifested by the language beliefs, the myths, the traditions too, and a number of shared sites or places where people would go from around Greece. Oracles, like the one at Delphi, with its priestess of Apollo, called Pythia, or Olympia, where every four years Greek athletes from all over Greece congregated to participate in sport competitions, the ancient Olympic Games. These were places or traditions that all Greeks considered theirs. The Olympic Games had a cultural and political significance. 
independently from sport itself. First, because they drew a line between who was civilized, or part of the Greek world, which was the same thing, and who wasn't. They were also a way to peacefully evacuate the thirst for competition and physical violence. The games also celebrated values that the Greeks considered to be theirs, values like the taste for competition, for effort, for testing one's limits. To a degree, they may have been a kind of substitute to heroism for participants, a way to approach the achievements and the status of all these famous mythical heroes in a real world in which there are no monsters to slay and the gods do not appear to mortals to send them on a quest. So they contributed to ancient the world, to pacify, and an aspect of this cultural importance of the games was their religious dimension. Obviously, this religious part is no longer present in modern Olympic games. We could argue that they keep this pacifying function between countries, between peoples, at least to a point. They organize a ritualized competition between them. It is not surprising that countries spend that much money on training and sending athletes. They want to assert their international status by doing so. And Olympic medals turn into a way to uh, quantify how successful a nation, a country, a society is. Success in sport competitions is still seen as one aspect of a nation's aura or prestige. But there are no longer gods involved in the games. The religious aspect has disappeared. In antiquity, Olympic Games that took place every four years were dedicated to Zeus. There were sacrifices and rituals all along the Games that participated in the elevation of winning athletes and also unified further the Greeks. Not just around a short list of values, like modern Olympic Games define themselves, Fair play, surpassing oneself, breaking records, friendship between nations. The rituals also signified that all of Greece could stand unified, even for a short time. Unified under the king of gods, the master of Mount Olympus, Zeus. Which brings us back to the statue. In the 5th century BC, the city of Elis, that were the custodians of the site, not the owners, because anyone could come to Olympia. But having Olympia on its territory was a source of prestige for Elis, a political card in their hand. So the city was looking for ways to project its power and wealth, as well as maybe attract favors from Zeus. And the Athenians had recently commissioned their big chryselephantine statue of Athena, Athena Parthenos, that was placed in the inner chamber, the naos of her temple, on the Athenian Parthenon. The Elian, the people of Elis, gave themselves the goal to surpass Athens, and they took no risk. They hired the same sculptor, Phidias, and asked for a statue that would be more impressive, a little higher, but given that Zeus would be seated on the throne, instead of standing up like Athena, the sculpture would be easily 50% more voluminous than Athena Parthenos. This was absolutely a display of wealth and influence, besides the religious significance of this work. 
and it worked as intended. The statue was housed inside a new temple on the site of Olympia, which consisted of a collection of shrines, temples and sport facilities that were used every four years for competitions. The fame of the sculpture grew quickly and people would visit Olympia just to see it. We have testimonies of Greek and later Roman authors, of travelers who speak highly of the statue's beauty and the impression it made on visitors. Contrary to Athena Parthenos, we have no small-scale exact reproduction of this statue, so we don't exactly know the details of it. We only have many descriptions and a few imprecise representations, for example on coins issued by the city of Elis, that was proudly cashing in on its investment, reminding everyone that the statue was its gift to Zeus. Zeus was recognized everywhere as the king of Olympian gods in the Greek world and the mythology that made him the victor of his father, Cronus, and the first among his peers, was well known all around Greece and beyond. But it doesn't mean his was the most popular of all cults in Greece. Many cities had their patrons that they revered, that they worshipped more than Zeus and it really depended on the places. A deity that may well have received more devotion along the history of ancient Greece than Zeus is Apollo, a god with multiple aspects depending on traditions. Apollo was the sun, the god of magic, divination, of beauty, of the arts. Apollo was extremely popular He had sanctuaries mainly dedicated to him, like in Delphi, and probably various chryselephantine effigies around Greece. Even though probably known as spectacular as the one of Zeus at Olympia. For such an expensive and fragile work of art, the sculpture had an impressive longevity. It was probably still there in the 4th century AD, more than seven centuries after its creation. It certainly owed its longevity to the care these chryselephantine sculptures received. The other masterpiece of Phidias, Athena Parthenos, also lasted for centuries. And the thing that justified the care for the statue of Zeus was the ongoing activity at Olympia. Despite wars with the Persians, Alexander the Great's epic, infighting between the Greeks, Roman occupation, Olympia and its games went on for centuries. They had lost some of their shine, of their prestige, when all of Greece had become part of the Roman Empire, but they still went on. And culturally, the eastern half of the Roman Empire always remained more culturally Greek than Latin, if we consider the languages people spoke and used to write. What really led to the end of the sanctuary of Olympia was Christianization. By the end of the 4th century AD, the Roman Emperor Theodosius I, who was a strong proponent of Christianity, ordered that all pagan cults should be banned and the temples closed. Greece was still firmly controlled by the Romans at the time, and it was applied. The sanctuary fell into disuse and started to turn into ruins. We don't exactly know what happened to the statue, but it lasted less than a century after the abandonment of Olympia. The temple was severely damaged by a fire. 
in 425 AD, about 30 years after Olympia had stopped functioning. It is well possible that the statue was destroyed in this fire. The statue, or more probably just its wooden frame, because it seems unlikely that so much gold, ivory and gems would have been left abandoned in an empty temple. An alternative to this possibility is that the statue was disassembled and taken somewhere else. This is not impossible because there used to be a tradition in Constantinople, the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire of Byzantium, that said that the statue of Zeus would have been moved there and destroyed by the end of the 5th century AD in the fire of the palace where it had been placed. This story was mentioned by at least one medieval historian of Byzantium, but there is no proof at all that it was real, and he talked about it 600 years after the facts supposedly happened, so this is not a very solid story. There are also accounts from the centuries before Theodosius banned pagan cults that could suggest that the statue had already been damaged or looted when Olympia was closed. So the exact date of its destruction gets lost in the sands of time. Olympia was emptied and the remaining structures turned to ruins that were further damaged by earthquakes, by the lack of maintenance and vegetation and sediments that slowly covered the sanctuary. The site was then abundantly explored and researched by archaeologists in modern times. No direct sign of the statue was found, which is not surprising its materials were either very precious and had probably been taken away long ago or perishable. But a place was discovered at Olympia, a place called Phidias Workshop, that further confirmed the existence of the statue. This workshop was found near the place where the statue would have stood, according to ancient accounts and it consists of an old room, of course no roof or walls had survived, but in this room, tools to work with gold and ivory were found, together with small ivory clippings and terracotta molds that would have been used to make glass-based parts of the statue, or replace them because it is impossible to affirm that these tools were used by Phidias. It even sounds rather unlikely, because the statue was maintained successfully on the site for at least 600 or 700 years, and usually no tools can serve that long. But what is well possible is that this workshop was used by the caretakers of the statue, which, as we saw before, required a team and constant care. So that could have been the place where they recreated broken parts or adjusted the plaques, the slabs, that maintained the illusion that the sculpture was all gold and ivory. The remains found also helped understand how the statue was made. For example, the clay molds were shaped to create glass plaques that formed the statue's robe. The molds were sculpted to follow the shape of draperies. And these sheets or plaques of glass were then gilded when they had been placed on the statue. It is impossible to say whether Phidias actually worked in this workshop but it is a valuable testimony of how the statue was made and taken care of for so many generations. 
And with this, we conclude the story of this other wonder of the ancient world. You can now let go and fall asleep, or if you are not sleepy yet, you can pick another one from my library. I'll be back soon with another story, in which I will take you to a fifth wonder, the temple of goddess Artemis in Ephesus. In the meantime, sleep well, sweet dreams, au revoir.